The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. Schroeders is a global asset and wealth manager with broad expertise across public and private markets, investing on behalf of individuals, institutions and advisors. We support advisors to help their clients build successful portfolios to achieve their goals, whatever they may be. We are proud to be partnering with Ensemble to host a dedicated investment space on the Ensemble platform to have more meaningful conversations with their clients and to give advisors a more efficient way to engage with Schroeders. Join the Schroeders investment space on the Ensemble platform today. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Uh, I was looking at who uh, were some of the most high-performing podcast guests. As a result, I've dragged Paul Barrett from AZ NGA back onto the podcast, mate. It is great to have you. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Clayton. Good to see you, mate. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So I saw you present overseas in the Philippines a, a little while ago, and it reminded me uh, it's always good to listen to you talk because you've got the finger on the pulse, sort of unlike uh, a lot of people in the industry. And um, there were some really cool things that you were discussing at that, uh, at that offsite. And I thought if we could bring it into the podcast so more people could understand it, that would be awesome. So sort of jumping into it, let's talk about uh, you know those financial planning practices that are, that are getting access to cash for growth. The thematics that underpin the space, you're probably the best to, to speak to on this. So what are you seeing? What what can financial planners do to, to get the, you know, get the attention of that money? Well, thanks, Clayton. Um, that's, a, that's a full toss on lead stuff, that one, <laughs> this brilliant analogy. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the word thematic or themes, and I think that's spot on. Like when you think about uh, investing in something, um, no matter who you are, you, you try to understand what is the investment thesis. You know what are the themes that make something attractive. And I have to say, right now, there's probably more talk about investment in financial planning firms, and in fact, more investment in financial planning firms than I've ever seen before. But the talk and the noise and the chatter, particularly from foreign um, investors, actually, is at an all-time high in terms of my sort of twenty or thirty years doing this. And you think about the reasons for that and some of the themes for that. A few things come to mind. Uh, the first one would, would be there appears to be a systemic change in the demand supply curve. Okay, there are increasing numbers of people seeking advice. And I actually think COVID is partly responsible for this because COVID created, you know, all at the same time all over the world quite a bit of consumer anxiety. And when you get anxiety levels in a system spiking, it creates the need for advice and, and people want to reach out to another fellow human being to talk about this stuff. So you've got this increase in demand. But at the exact same time, you've got this reduction, if you like, in supply. It's been well documented, the number of um, well, the, 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 the number of advisors heading to the exit doors in our space, and that continues. I, the latest sort of predictions I'm hearing are that advisor numbers might reach 12,000 soon enough. And so you've got this... Systemic change in supply at exactly the same time, you've got an increase in demand. And, and of course, th this is the reason why people should listen to Michelle Liddy and the, and the QAR proposals, because it actually seeks to address this. Um, yeah. But in any case, you've got that demand supply thing, a couple of things going on. Uh, you've got this fragmentation out of space. So a whole bunch of, of SMEs who once upon a time were somehow tethered to big safe haven like a bank, and now are out on their own, getting their own license or you know, operating are more independently and so you've got this fragmentation happening and and if you look back in time you know, fragmentation gets followed by consolidation and then more fragmentation then more consolidation it's like a repeating cycle and we're in that fragmentation phase at the moment third thing would be smes are getting more corporatized so that's seeking for partnerships with firms that are going to help them do more sophisticated stuff you've got your know, talk of regulatory tailwinds for the first time probably in 20 years 
which in itself is a a, a theme that is um, you know, particularly interesting to people with money and, and foreign investors. So normally you don't need one of these themes to drive a business case. Right now, we've got four or five thematics all playing out at exactly the same time. Yeah, that's a really good point. What? Why do you think financial planners have, and it looks looks like this from where I'm seated anyway, um, or seated, and that is financial planners are coming at the business of financial planning in a much more professional way. There seems to be an uplift, I would say, in the personal responsibility that the management of these firms are, are, are taking. Um, if you go back sort of before my time, 20 years ago, it was it was a lot about turnover of business. These days, you're hearing a lot more talk of EBITDA. And just, just that sort of, even that simple um, differentiation is an indication that people are taking the business of financial planning a lot more seriously. Is is that a coming? Is that a, a coming of age for the profession? You, you just you just used the word business, okay? And 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 that's fundamentally what's going on. Planners have gone from being distributors of product, you know, tethered to institutions, to business people. And once those subsidies all dried up and that and that that link to the institution, the product provider got got broken. Then these operators had to make a decision. Are we going to stay in the sector? And if so, you know, how much will we invest in becoming business pe- better business people and running better businesses? So the conversations that I've had in various roles over the last sort of 20 years uh, with planners, those conversations have changed. They've gone from, you know, talking about the Rothschild Five Arrows you know, equity fund back in the 90s uh, to, you know, let's talk about business succession, business planning, strategy, pricing, all these sorts of things. And so... You've got this completely new world now for the operators in the space. No longer are they distributors, they are business people. And not everyone was able to make that transition, but those who have, have made it uh, with gusto. And so you've now got this insatiable appetite uh, from you know, owners and operators of these businesses for valuable services that they're quite prepared to pay for. Yeah. Such as you know governance and strategy and M and A and outsourcing all these sorts of things, which is why this discussion we've been having over the last few months about licensees is so interesting because you know, licensees don't appear to have made the same transition yet. Yeah, that these business owners have made licensees could do the same thing. They'll just start picking what are the valuable services that we can supply to these planning businesses that are now businesses that they're going to be prepared to pay for. And so you've got this modernization uh, out of necessity inside these SME businesses. And I say out of necessity because back in the old days, you didn't need to think about these things because back in the old days, you got paid a subsidy from product providers to give advice on product. That's what's changed. Because the the classic sort of analogy is the lawyers and you know the large consulting firms, the accounting firms, this concept of these mega practices or these mega firms where people become partners, is this something that you see happening or is it is it slightly different? Is it a financial planning take on that more traditional scalable business model? Well, you, there's quite a few nuances to your question. Um, firstly, this concept of partnership is not one I would advocate for financial planning firms because the partnership model, uh, it, it means something. Okay, particularly in the accounting space, it means something. And the partnership model, in, in, in our in our view at AZNGA, has some flaws to it. We think a more corporatized model, based on high performance, is the way forward for financial planning firms. Not a partnership model that might be based more on entitlement. And so, I just want to clarify that. But what I would say to you is that you know size and scale is definitely something that these SME owners and operators are thinking about. But before they think about size and scale, that they're more likely to be thinking about capability. So, so you're seeing the conversation around the boardroom in these firms move towards, well, what's our consumer segment that we're trying to serve? And what's our source of sustainable competitive advantage that, that we can take to that segment? In other words, what, what sort of product or service can we specialize in yeah. and take to that segment? And specialization 
it appears to be a trend amongst the most high-performing firms. And I don't mean you just do one thing, you do it really well. I mean, firms will do a number of things, but they'll, but they'll have these their collection of specializations under one roof that they take to their consumer segment. And consumers appear to be far more willing to pay more for something that is perceived to be deeply specialized and yeah. more and more and more um, nuanced and complex. So that's a trend I'm seeing. But then in terms of scale, yeah, there's there's no doubt that these SME businesses are getting bigger because they, they, they take a view that if we build or buy capability and we keep doing it, we're going to get bigger. And as we get bigger, we can actually, you know, sell more services to more to, to, to the same client group. Uh, and we can get some degree of efficiency and synergy out of our scale. I think those sorts of synergy benefits are often overstated. What's more likely to drive the size and the increase in size of these firms is the sophistication around what they're taking to their client base. So we have firms in our network that you know, have particular demographics, for instance, they specialize. So take, for example, the uh, example of a pharmaceutical uh, demographic or client group. So we have two firms now in our portfolio that specialize in pharmacies and they get to know the life cycle of a pharmacist from cradle to grave and they then deploy a number of specialized services that target that particular demographic. Wow. They talk them all together and then they've got the client for life. So that's the sort of thinking that you're starting to see inside these firms that I don't reckon, I don't reckon you saw that 10, 15 no. years. Uh, and so that's what we're seeing changing. Um, let's duck into the issue that you mentioned before around the lack of supply. And I guess probably two, uh, and, and this is, sort of leads into the QAR, but before, you know, there, there needs to be sort of a conversation that's had as a, as a bit of a stopgap between where we are now and, and QAR coming into play in, in whatever that looks like. But ultimately with the, with, with advisors leaving, you can, you can also attach to that the lack of new supply of new advisors, right? So uh, the university graduates, all the top dogs are looking at, they're, uh, they're looking at McKinsey or they're looking at, um, you know, investment banking and these types of things. And financial planning rarely, if ever, gets a, gets a show in at that stage, right? Where the, the whole profession has always relied on the big banks sucking people up from different um, uh, areas of, of, of the workforce and then running them through some training. That obviously has ceased to occur. Yes, there's a professional year, which in some ways makes things easier, but in certainly many others can make things more difficult. Are you seeing a solution across the practices under AZNGA that have gone to some effort or, or have solved that problem to some degree? Yeah, really complex discussion. This um, there's a couple of forces I think at play here. The, the, the first one is if you have a professional industry, however you want to describe it, that has low barriers to entry, which we've had for 20 or 30 years here. In the end, in the end, that's going to catch up with you because in the end, it's, especially as regulation sort of starts dampening some of the economic opportunities that you might have had in the old days. What happens is people don't take the profession seriously. So it's not like, you know, a young person goes to their career guidance counselor at school, like I remember doing, and says, hey, you know what? I want to be a planner. Tell me about how I do that. Because it doesn't feature in the in the sort of career set of, of inspirational things to do. Yeah. Okay? And so therefore, I'm, I'm of the view that you've got to increase the, you've got to increase the queue at the, at the nightclub door by making it harder to get in. Okay. Yes. So by increasing barriers to entry, making it more prestigious, I think it normally would have a positive effect actually on the attractiveness of your of your area of your segment. However, what's going against that? Okay, a, a counterbalancing force to my argument is that globally we're seeing uh, a trend that sees profession services careers being less attractive, and there are now you know tech careers and online careers and. Uh, you know, building a YouTube channel or building Facebook. I mean, there's a whole range of new opportunities in the new economy that are attracting talent where there's less regulation and higher economic returns. And so you've got the sort of counterbalance to my to my argument. And so what are the solutions? You know, what are some of the solutions to that? Well, I think you've got to continue to make your 
your um, industry or profession more attractive. I think you've got to continue to lobby politicians and government to make it more more easy to deploy your solution. So the analogy I use here is we should have higher barriers to entry, but once you get in, it should be easy to operate. But, you know, I've said before that a planner has to jump a speed hump and then they get a hard life, whereas a doctor has to climb a mountain to get an easy life. Right. So once, so once you've got through your barrier, you then get a certain type of life afterwards. And we've got a hard life because our barrier is too low. That needs to change, okay? And, 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 and that will actually see more capital come in, more investment in the sector, hopefully more human capital come in as well. However, however, globally, there are some far more attractive, uh, it, it, it appears, careers for people to pursue. And so how do we sort of try and overcome that? Well, one of the things we've done in the last 12 months We've looked at this supply of talent issue and we've realized, you know what? We are restraining ourselves geographically to try to solve this problem because we have this mindset of you've got to go and hire people from your local suburb. The reason we invested in virtual business partners, there are a few reasons. One of the key ones, you know, 1,200 Filipinos working out of Cebu, growing by 60 a month. Why do we do that? Because there's a talent pool in a, another marketplace that we can access to try and solve this problem. Now, that won't be a necessarily a long-term sustainable thing. We'll have to do other things too, but that is a clear example of a solution to this issue. COVID showed us all working remotely works. Yes. Well, working remotely doesn't just mean working from the suburbs of Sydney, okay? It can mean working from the suburbs of Cebu. Yes. Or of Mumbai or wherever, okay? Yes. And so there's a number of things we're doing to try and to try and solve this. One of the things I know you're working on is attracting teachers uh, and and from you know other yeah. professions. I think that's grand there. I think that's a masterstroke, and particularly teachers. I mean that yeah. Yeah, targeting another sector where the underlying skill sets are, are, are right for what we're trying to do, offering them a better economic outcome. Another great example of of, of trying to solve the problem. Yes. Um, that question was a lead into the next question, which ultimately gets the QAR. So then the next question becomes, if there is an undersupply of talent, what are you doing or what is AZNGA doing or what are the practices doing in regards to tech efficiencies and to scalable advice? I, I mean, it, every business is a tech business these days, obviously, but what sort of one to 10, how important do you see um, tech efficiencies in practices these days? Yeah, well, firstly, um, given that in 1969 we could put man on the moon, um, I'm assuming that technology exists in 2023 that can greatly enhance financial planning. <laughs> okay, so let me start with that. Okay, because what I'm now going to say is I just haven't seen it yet. Right? Oh, no, yeah. So, exactly. so like we, 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 we talk to all sorts of invention tech companies all the time. Yes. Yeah. And they will have some common um, issues. Firstly, they don't have money. Okay. And, uh, and when you're going to actually start um, putting into your ecosystem tech solutions, you want to make sure they're sustainable business models. Yes. So we're waiting for serious money to flow into the sector in terms of tech spend. It's starting to happen. But there's a long, long way to go. So we've got to make this sector more attractive to people with money to invest yep. in tech, okay? But do I think it'll happen? Absolutely, I do. I think it's inevitable tech will make a, have a major mark on the way we deploy uh, our services uh, in, in Australia. No, no question. QAR, yeah, that, 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 that may play a role and uh, may not, depending on where you think that's going to go. But, uh, uh, you yeah, know, that, that will be potentially one element. But I, I do think that... It's coming. What I would say though, right now, if I had if I had a hundred units of effort to yep. spend on efficiency, I'd probably spend eighty units of the hundred on better processes and policies, uh, and I'd spend the remaining twenty on tech because there's a whole bunch of low hanging fruit around around efficiency that can be dealt with and answered uh, by improving policies and processes. Tech comes second. And inevitably, I think if you fast forward, say five years, it'll probably be the other way around. You know, tech will start playing more of a role. But there's a way to go yet. That's uh, yeah, I, I, um, that eighty twenty rule because ultimately, tech is there to simply automate policies and procedures 
that can be automated, right? Because the policy, the, 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 the operational flow is the operational flow. And then you want tech to handle as much of it as possible. Yeah, but you listen to what you're saying, right? What, what, what you're using some big words and yeah, these SME businesses, like if you came along with the best tech solution to an SME business, SME businesses don't have change management and project management skills. And this is another issue that's holding tech companies back. They build the best mousetrap and get frustrated that planners won't use it. The reason planners won't use it is planners don't have the capability in their organizations to deploy that tech properly and do all the change management. And that's why, again, back to your earlier question, as, as SMEs get larger and get better capability, they'll be better able to deploy tech solutions. But that's been another thing holding it back. Another thing holding tech back, of course, has been regulations, right? I mean, the regulatory environment has not allowed tech uh, suppliers the freedom that they would enjoy in other in other sectors. And I suppose that's where you're getting that's what you're getting at with your QAR uh, question. It will the QAR make it easier for tech companies? Well, maybe uh, if we can get a better feel for the risk appetite, uh, then maybe. Interesting. So, in in regards to talent, I uh, I think we share definitely common grounds in terms of the issues there. Tech, uh, it's great to hear your view. I think, as I mentioned right at the at the beginning, I think you have a very unique view because you're very intimate with a lot of successful practices. So it's interesting to to hear your view on that. Let's assume that let's move across into QAR. Let's assume for a moment that um, the QAR moves ahead in in a way that's very beneficial to financial planners. In a way that you know, assuming that commissions are certainly on investments and superannuation and are still no longer available. And and as a result, the, the chances of conflicts have, have reduced. As a result, the uh, the documentation required uh, is reduced. And so we go from a scenario where a, a planner can handle uh, 100 clients into a scenario where a planner can handle, let's call it 200 clients, right? And, and potentially up from there, but even just a, a factor of two, what do you see uh, as being, I guess, the the easiest way to go from uh, handling 100 clients to 200 clients if talent and tech aren't immediately the solutions? How would I, as a principal uh, advisor, look w- under, with your view, go from 100 to 200 in the event the QAR was beneficial to me? Getting rid of SOIs. Bam, just like that. Oh, well, you have a, have a, take an analytical look and a real, an honest look at what financial planning firms actually are, okay? Lemonade stands make lemonade, okay? And they, and they sell it to thirsty customers on a hot summer's day. That's what they do. Financial planners manufacture regulatory documents and they, and they, and they spend, if you look at, if you do a time and motion study on all of the activities of a planning firm day to day, the vast majority of the time is spent on these regulatory documents, preparing regulatory documents, yes, and 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 having having a hard life. Back to my earlier analogy, all of the compliance around all of that. By putting barriers to entry up and giving people an easier life and taking the heat off around compliance and the production of these regulatory documents, you will en- you will enable planners to use their minds and professional judgment. And this is the bit that we need to shift to, because right now. Financial planners remind me of NPCs, non-player characters in video games. Non-player characters, what do they do? They run around the place based on the rules engine and algorithm that the programmer built for them. Yeah. They can't think for themselves. When I watch my son play Fortnite and he's player one, I watch him. He jumps when he wants to. He runs when he wants to. He shoots when he wants to. He's using his mind and professional judgment. The only person in the video game that is able to do that is player one. Okay. Okay. How do planners become player one? Okay, that, that is a key challenge. And, 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 and if we don't have to be burdened by these regulatory documents and processes and we can use our minds, we no longer have to be NPCs. We can then be player one. That's the single most, I think, obvious slow-hanging fruit that we can grab hold of out of, out of QAR. In order to do that, we need to have a long look at our risk appetite in this country. Like we, we do, in Australia, we appear to like rules and regulations and we like the flags to be narrow and we all want to swim between them. Yeah. I heard on the weekend that rap music was banned at the Easter show. Okay. okay. There is an example right there of what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay. Okay. And when I read all the reaction to the QAR, what I read, what I see is people who are fearful. 
Okay. People who have a risk tolerance of not very high, maybe not zero, but closer to zero than than I am. Okay. So we all need to lead our self-interest and egos at the door with this discussion in the QAR. And we need to understand that there has to be an element of risk. If you want if you want to solve this problem about more advice to more Australians more affordably, you've got to take a little more risk in order to achieve that. Yes. And it, it's risk that apparently uh, we're not prepared to take at the moment. And so my call to action would be to all comers in this debate, try and leave self-interest at the door, except the fact that we do need to take a little more risk in order to get the great return for all Australians that we're all, we're all seeking here. Yes. Um, this question leads into um, something we touched on very briefly earlier, but that is the licensee model. Um, traditionally, there has been a view of, well, if my license says I can do it, then I can. If my license says I can't, then I won't. Um, with masses of advisors moving across into either small boutique or self-licensed land, those decisions are now far more available and, and open to the financial planner. So in a way, we've almost seen a, a changing of the guard with the licensee model without the rules actually changing. I will include the word yet there. So assuming that um, the licensee model from a regulatory, a regulatory point of view does change and sort of continues to go into the direction that it's already been moving... If you, if you, if I was to say licensees haven't quite yet found their role in the new world, what would you say to an advisor looking at licensees? What should they be looking for? What is your recommendation to both both stakeholders in terms of a good relationship? We'll start with the licensees. Um, the, my my advice to licensees would be start with a white sheet of paper and work out what services your clients and licensees clients are advisors are prepared to value and pay for okay and be honest about that and either build or buy those services and package them up and sell them at a fee that you can make money out of this business model is baked in the past around well you know we've always done it this way so we'll keep providing tech services and compliance training and then we'll charge nearly nothing for them that is not a sustainable model okay in, in outside of that unusual environment that licensees operate in in the real world people put a margin on top of their costs and build profitable service offerings okay the same thing needs to apply here they've got to go back to basics and so if i'm running a licensee today i'm thinking well, okay what if advisors are, are fragmenting and they're all hitting off of their own license how do i win the bat what sort of services do i need to supply them it might be things like m a services outsourcing governance marketing lead gen there's a bunch of really high value add services that there's no reason they can't supply mm. but for whatever reason they're not supplying those they're supplying more kind of ancient artifacts that the clearly advisory companies don't value and that's why they're leaving and actually taking a little more risk by doing that uh, but they're doing it because they want to control their service offering and they, and they don't want to be they don't want to be constrained around swimming between these very narrow very narrow flags that the licensees put on the beach in terms of the planners um, and, and the way that this sort of question affects them, you know, going into your own license carries with it extra risk and, and a different capability set. I think the best outcome is that planners find a licensee that does offer value-add services and that the planners are prepared to, pl- to pay proper money for those services because yeah. they see there is real value in that. So, so it's, a, you know, it's a bit on both, on both part, uh, parties there. But one thing is for sure, this licensee or dealer group model, it, it, it ain't going to cut it in the future. It, it just it just isn't going to work. Uh, and so I think we need to forget about licensees as we know them or knew them and start thinking about services businesses and how a services business ought to take its proposition to advisors and make money out of that. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine um, you would see a lot of licensee models that are out there, and, and I'm sure you probably – speak to a lot of your practices about the licensees that they're dealing with. Um, let's talk for a moment, if we can, about N- AZNGA. Where are you guys headed? Are you are you headed further and further into any particular of these subjects that we've discussed today? I mean, it, there, there, is the licensee model something that you're interested in? Is tech efficiencies and tech plays something you're interested in? Is the outsourcing with your relationship with VBP? 
or is it all of the above or none of the above? Are you agnostic? What, what, let's talk about if we can for a moment, uh, what does AZ look like? Let's say 12 months, five years, 10 years down the line. Wow. <laughs> now, ah. Well, the simple answer is yeah, all of the above. <laughs> we can leave it at that. <laughs> um, oh, look, if you think about it, like Clayton, it, it, and yeah, look at the financial services sector in Australia. Not that long ago, there were lots of you know, great companies of some scale delivering great services to advisors and the clients of advisors. Their landscape's changed quite a bit. It's changed quite a bit in the last probably five to ten years. And, you know, the, the, the struggles of some of the larger players well documented and you know, certain players have got out altogether. And I can't... It looks, it looks to me like we are in a one-off inflection point. It looks to me with all of this fragmentation going on and the big end of town essentially playing a different role, if any role, there is a wonderful opportunity for an innovative firm like ours to come in and actually supply valuable services, valuable profitable services to a growing number of SMEs who are no longer tethered to institutions, okay? So, you know, we want to build a, a wonderful financial services company uh, and that that company will, you know, be a B two B company that serves advisors and provides attractive, valuable services to them, and it, and ought to include a lot of the things you've just mentioned. Could it include licensing? Yeah, it could, but that would just be one slither of a broader proposition that included a, a whole range of very profitable, valuable things, and that's why using an M and A strategy up until now, we've been accumulating capability. So what have we really been up to? We've been buying capability so that we can then assemble it together in a in a well-organized way to provide a really compelling proposition to the SMEs around Australia and our sector. That's what we're doing. Um, it's 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 really quite simple. But the, the beauty is in the execution, making sure that you can invest in quality assets, both financial planning firms themselves and accounting firms, but also in some of the components of the supply chain and, and, and VBP is an example of that. So that's what we're up to. In terms of five years plus, you know, we, we would like to create, you know, one of, we'd like to create a financial services company that Australians can be proud of. And, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were, those terms existed. Okay. They're on the nose now. Okay. There's an opportunity for a firm like ours to, to, to make Australians proud of a financial services business. That's what I want to do. Uh, and 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 there's a, there seems to be a right time, right place feel about this. Okay, yeah, we entered into acquiring venture planning companies, companies for a royal commission. So you so you might say, well, get your time over again. Would you do it a few years later? The answer would be no, truly, because that royal commission actually enabled us to bring forward a whole bunch of business transformation to a compressed period, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I I wouldn't change anything. But it's, there's a right time, right place feel about it. And, you know, we're executing well. We're going to continue to do that. One thing I would say, though, is that alongside our strategy of partnering with SMEs, we think there's an opportunity to invest in some larger firms as well. So we might actually increase our M&A program in the, in the next few months and the next couple of years to capitalize on, on this one-off opportunity that exists in the market today. Well, wow, very interesting. Um, to me, I I fell in love with this finance, this you know whether you call it an industry or a profession, but I fell in love with it you know a while ago, and uh, and it's always been uh, you know I've always looked at it and thought the the opportunity to do something innovative is there. That that they just when I look at it, there seems to be a massive gap in the sense that everyone was just walking down this traditional business model and and trying to to, to uh, you know what I would call back in my uh back in my Nam Bucket days you know hit the red band on it right um it, it was it was all about trying to get that thing and run it as hard as as hot as you could but there is there is so much uh, around you know in between all the gaps and the fringes of this industry that if you if you can capture it you can do something interesting with it and um and it's been I mean AZNGA has been around for it, it's been around for a while right eight years. Eight years. That's what I'm talking about, right? So this is not this is the the thing that I'm really enjoying about seeing what's going on is it's a it's a result of eight years of of probably making good decisions and then learning from others and 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 now you've got this really clear message which is one that's extremely positive 
and the fact that you get to see all the best and probably the worst parts of the industry um, in in doing all the due diligence amongst the practices is is yeah it's 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 one of the things that being on this side of the coin with ensemble it's always really interesting to hear so I appreciate your time mate um are you speaking in uh, in the Philippines again this year yes yeah oh, okay very cool I'm uh, I'm thinking about coming over I know Emily's actually presenting at the event as well which is okay. super cool yeah so uh it's always a good excuse to get over there anyway thanks for your time very much appreciate it. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure in the next couple of years, we'll get it done again. Oh, so thanks, Titan. Cheers, mate. See you, mate. This material does not contain and should not be relied on for financial, accounting, legal or tax advice. Schroeder's does not give any warranty as to the accuracy, reliability or completeness of information presented. Visit www.schroeders.com.au forward slash advisors for more information about our funds.